Hi everyone, this is your lecture video for chapter 8. We're still in week 6. I already recorded and uploaded your chapter 7 lecture. This goes along with chapter 8. So chapter 8 is about point of view, but it also includes the concepts of fact versus opinion, author purpose, and author tone. So it's a rather heavy chapter. It covers multiple concepts. So I do really encourage you to make sure that you spend some time kind of as I go through this video, pulling up the PowerPoint on your own, looking through there, going into our textbook and looking more at some examples and practices and things of that nature within the actual textbook. Um, take advantage of the optional practices that I've uploaded, all of that, just to make sure that you're getting all of this information. Again, with you know the online class, it, it's just a little different than what we would be doing face-to-face. -face. We would be having a chance to get to do more practices and pull in more examples than we would online. So it kind of falls on your shoulders to do a little bit more of that work. All right, so let's talk about all these concepts. So as I mentioned, we're talking about point of view, fact, opinion, purpose, and tone. So what is point of view? So basically, it's whenever you, you know, what's your point of view on this? It's the author's opinions on a particular subject matter. And an author's opinion will influence how they present material. It is going to make a difference what information they're going to include, not include, the way that they write the text. All of that is going to come back to kind of what is that author's point of view. When we say point of view, it can normally narrow down to two things. Um, the way that we're mostly talking about it in this chapter is again like that attitude or their opinion on a subject. Or in literacy, sometimes they'll say point of view, it's like the narrative voice for second, third person. We're really mostly focusing on that first definition right there. So what is author's point of view? So it's their choice of information, you know, if they're going to uh, provide facts and opinions, what type of facts and opinions, what is their tone, what is their purpose, all of these things play a role in really understanding and comprehending more in depth the author's message. So whenever you are reading something, whether it's a textbook, something online, you know, you're looking to see how the information is provided, what kind of opinions are there, what's the, the source, what is the purpose, all of those things, looking to see if an author has provided those to help you determine their point of view. It's one of the concepts that we have to be aware of as it relates to this chapter is bias, and it's very commonly tied in with point of view. So bias is when you have an opinion on a, on a subject and we, we all have bias. We do. We prefer like Pepsi over Coke or, you know, Target over Walmart, whatever the case is. It's natural for humans to have bias. However, we also have to keep in mind that sometimes our bias can influence both how we write and how we read information. And so we want to make sure that when we are reading, we take into consideration our own personal biases, as well as is an author presenting bias to us? Are they not giving us the full picture? So questions to uncover bias, like what is your opinion on the subject? How do you feel about the subject that you're reading? What is the author's opinion? What kind of words are they using to allow you to know what how they feel about it? And what are their credentials? Um, what kind of background do they have? Do they have education, ex experience? Do they work for a certain organization? All of that goes into like their credentials to see why they're writing this piece in the background for which they're coming from. Um, so other questions to keep asking yourself, like what does the author have to gain? What, what are they trying to do with this piece and in their opinion? Are they using facts and opinion? Are the opinions they're, they're using kind of slanted in their direction? So all of these again are questions to continue asking when you're trying to uncover bias. Connected to that is it's also important to know your own personal point of view. So if you come into a reading already having an opinion one way or the other, it might slant your thinking or it might close off your thinking. And so it's important to keep an open mind while you read. And so all of this is important to take into consideration as you are reading and understanding the author's point of view. Part of that also is being able to distinguish between fact and opinion. I know it seems very simple. You talk about fact and opinion from a very early age. However, sometimes it's not as clear cut as it seems. Authors often, just like politicians or many people, are really good at making their opinions look like facts. And so you, as a college student, have to be able to discern what is a fact versus an opinion. So just real basically, you know, a fact is a statement based on evidence or observation, you know, it can be proven, it can be 
checked, it can be measured, something can verify that information. You know, here are some examples of facts. And the number of law enforcement officials in the U.S. has increased since 2001. Can we verify that? Yeah, we can go back and we can look it up somehow. So a fact can be proven, and here's the, the kind of the gray area, true or false. A fact does not have to be true to be considered a fact. It is called a false fact. For instance, a long time ago, people thought the earth was flat, right? We have since come out with technology and, and science. We, that is no longer the case. That fact doesn't just go away. It becomes a false fact. So a fact that has been proven false then becomes a false fact. Facts can be proven true or false through some sort of means. Here are some other examples. The Earth is approximately 4.5 billion years old. The diameter of the Earth is 8,000 miles. The college has 10,000 students. All of those are facts that we could verify in some way, shape, or form. On the other hand, opinions then are statements of personal beliefs, things that you feel your judgments toward, your reflections on a particular topic, and they can't be proven. You cannot prove an opinion. It is personal to you. So it is something that is a judgment that's not provable. So taking that same example from above, law enforcement officials do a good job or law enforcement officials don't do their jobs well. Those are opinion words. You cannot prove those. It's how someone feels. Here are some other examples. Dr. Johnson is the best physiology instructor at the college. He probably wishes he had fewer classes. His students are lucky to be in his class. Those are all opinions. Best wishes, lucky. Those are judgment type words. So opinions cannot be proven true or false. And you often look for attitudes or feelings, um, good, bad, better, worse, as well as all future events. So if you are trying to make a prediction of something happening, you know, a week or a month or a year from now, that's an opinion. We cannot verify something that's going to happen in the future. Okay, so all future events, including predictions, are opinions. Here's some opinion phrases. So Often authors will use, you know, it appears that, or in my view, or this suggests, to almost pass something off as a fact when in all likelihood that is an opinion that they're trying to kind of twist into a fact. So these are common opinion phrases. You also have to use context because sometimes context will help you understand if something is being used in a factual way or an opinion way. So this is scientists may discover life on other planets in the universe. That's an opinion because it's a future event. It hasn't happened yet. It says they may discover other planets. However, the word may in this sentence, this rock cycle may occur either beneath the Earth's surface or on the Earth's surface. That is just saying like it can happen in place A or place B. It's still a fact. So you have to use context to help you figure it out. And then often you're going to see something that happens where there's a fact and an opinion in the same sentence. So the production of carbon monoxide or excuse me, carbon dioxide from human activities includes burning coal, gas, and oil. That is your fact, which may cause a serious climate change on the earth. That's a prediction, that's an opinion. It's a little bit of both combined there together. Now here is even more gray area. You have your facts, you have your opinions. The, this is the middle ground. Reason judgment, sometimes called informed opinions. So this is information that you have researched, you have evidence, and then based on that evidence or research or statistics, whatever it might be, you come to an informed opinion or reasoned judgment. So remember a few slides ago, I said all future events, including predictions, are opinions. So this brings me to the, the point of a meteorologist, right? Essentially what the meteorologist is doing is trying to predict the future. They're trying to tell you what the weather is going to be like a week from now or two weeks from now or even tomorrow. That's the future. So technically that's an opinion, but because they are using instruments and data that they have collected and all of this information in front of them, it's not just a wild guess. It is informed. So that's what they do. They have informed opinions or reasoned judgments. They are making their claims based on evidence. evidence. So in your folder, there is a practice in your optional. There's a practice like determining between fact and opinion or both. And you are welcome to kind of go through and practice to see if you can identify, is this a fact? Is this an opinion? Or is this contain a little bit of both? For instance, um, I'll do like one or two with you. Thomas Jefferson's Louisiana purchase doubled the territory of the United States, extending it to the Rocky Mountains. Well, I can look that up and verify that. So that is a fact. There's not any an opinion in there at all. Um, let's look at one 
right here. In 1882, the Chinese Exclusion Act denied the Chinese entry into the United States. It also denied citizenship to those Chinese already living in the United States. This was a clear case of legalized racism. Up until this point, this was all factual because we could look it up, we could verify it. Right here, because they use the phrase, this was a clear case of, that's an opinion phrase because what's clear to one person is not always clear to another. Um, let's look at one more. In 1943, the extraordinary Jacques Cousteau invented an improved diving suit that allowed divers to descend 500 feet below the surface of the ocean. Nowadays, that suit is usually referred to as a scuba suit. This is another example of both because almost all of this is factual, but this word right here, extraordinary, is an opinion word. It's a judgment word saying that something is good, bad, better, worse. And so it throws the whole thing from factual to both. So go ahead and look at the rest of those if you want to test to see are you able to identify if something is pure fact, pure opinion, or does it have a little bit of both combined? From there, we talk about author's purpose. So author's purpose is basically like why they write something. Whenever you write something, you hopefully have a purpose for what you are writing. Are you writing to inform, to entertain, to narrate? You know, so basically you're asking yourself the question, why did the author write this? And that's going to help you identify the author's tone, the author's bias, the author's point of view. This all goes hand in hand. Here are the five most common general purposes. To give information, to persuade, you know, to make you feel a certain way, to entertain, oh, I think that hopefully is self-explanatory, to narrate, to tell a story, to kind of walk you through a series of events, uh, and then to describe, and not just like to give details. Describe really goes into like what something smells like, tastes like, feels like. A lot of us visualize when we read, but this goes into more detail than that. This goes a little bit more trying to evoke your senses. So you always want to kind of look at the topic and main idea and again ask why did the author write this so thinking about this sentence right here the ocean tides are a result of the gravitational pull of the sun and moon if i look at that sentence which one of my purposes is that the ocean tides are a result of the gravitational pull of the sun and the moon hopefully you can tell that is in form that is trying to give me information what about these ones You should not swim in areas inhabited by sea lions and seals. You should not swim in swim in areas inhabited by sea lions and seals. So should not, whenever someone tells you what you should or should not do, they're trying to persuade you, trying to make you feel a certain way, convince you to be on their side. I'm on a seafood diet. I see food and I eat it. That's a little bit of a joke so we can see that that's to entertain so those are little examples of authors purpose um, I do have some more practices in your optional practice folder you know all of these kind of ask you like what is the author's purpose you can go through and you can see you know is this informative is this persuasive is this descriptive so it's going to kind of test you on some of those if you are able to identify what the author's purpose is and then of course you are going to see that inside your textbook as well and not this week if you know, we're watching this video in week six but in week seven chapter eight continues and you will have practice packets that have you identifying author purpose. All right, the next concept is author's tone. So I don't know if any of you have ever had like someone say to you, like, don't use that tone with me. Tone is just the author's attitude about a topic. And again, this kind of goes back to bias, making sure that your own attitude uh, is not influencing how you're reading something. And so the next several slides you can see here go through and just give you examples of tone and tone can take on generally three categories positive negative and kind of neutral so positive are all the things you would think of you know things like optimistic um, all struck compassionate you know negative would be more of like arrogant absurd and then neutral is when there's no opinion uh, the author is not presenting any type of you know, bias or feeling, they might be unbiased, meaning they don't have an opinion either way, or they're unbiased, they're giving you the good and the bad. So all of these slides go over many, many examples of the types of tones that you might expect to see, and you will not be expected to like label any of them by any means. Um, point of view and editorial cartoons, if you already watched the chapter seven lecture video, you would have seen, I talked a little bit about this already because authors can use editorial cartoons to portray feelings. They can make some implications that way. They can also portray their tone. They can also show their attitude through that means. 
All right, so that is your chapter eight lecture. You can see there's a little bit of overlap with chapter seven with some of that like inference and, and editorial cartoons and bias and things of that nature. In your optional folder, there are also some practices on bias that connect with chapter seven and chapter eight. So again, bias means does the author feel a particular way about a topic? Um, usually, again, it can go down to three things, bias in favor, so I, I feel positive about this topic, so I'm only going to present the positive components. I feel negative about this, so I'm only going to present the negative components. Or I have no opinion, so I'm just going to be very neutral, straightforward. I'm not going to present the good or the bad because it's just the facts. Along those lines, they can also be unbiased, meaning I'm going to give you both sides of the story, negative and positive, so you can kind of make your own mind up. So those examples are in the optional practice folder there where you can look through you can see chapter seven inferences, chapter eight, there are websites you can go through and bias practice here if you wanted to fill out and see if you could identify if there's bias present. Um, and feel free to you know, send me back this through an attachment. I can give you some feedback on it. Uh, again, as I mentioned before, you know, look at chapter eight, go through, see if you can look through some of these exercises, the passages, practice all of these different concepts because there are a lot. They're very closely tied together. I know like author's purpose and tone and bias, they all work together to help you get a fuller understanding of the author's overall message. As always, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out with any of these topics. Until next time.